which Transformer was only added as a marketing gimmick for Chevy? What was the hardest scene Michael Bay shot for the entire series? Roll into these awesome details from the billion dollar franchise. The Transformers movies went on to become massive hits at the box office, but they weren't originally an area of intense focus for producer Don Murphy. Back in 2007, Murphy explained to Latino Review that his original goal when it came to turning toys into massive live-action movies was the G.I. Joe franchise. Murphy had undergone lengthy conversations with Hasbro about acquiring the film rights to the property, and Sony Pictures was even floating the idea of distributing this potential film adaptation. However, real-world events soon cut Murphy's ambitions for G.I. Joe short. The invasion of Iraq suddenly made the prospect of adapting that specific toy into a globally appealing franchise much less feasible. The then head of Hasbro Films, Carol Monroe, proceeded to point Murphy in the direction of the Transformers property as another Hasbro IP he could adapt into a film. While Murphy didn't have any childhood nostalgia for Transformers, he did know that other close creative partners like producer Tom DeSanto harbored a passion for the franchise. Recognizing the fan base for those robots in disguise, Murphy got to work on getting Transformers off the ground. The result was a pop culture phenomenon that would have never happened if Murphy's initial G.I. Joe plans had gotten off the ground. Now I know! And knowing is half the battle. Michael Bay stabs at Transformers movies very wildly in the characters they chronicle, and even the time periods they travel to, but they all tend to share one quality, a focus on human characters. We begin these tales with human beings like Sam Witwicky and Cade Yeager, and view gigantic sci-fi adventures largely through their eyes. With each new Transformers movie, the robotic characters get to be more and more prominent, but the humans are still at the forefront of the narrative. Believe it or not, there was a point in time when the original live-action Transformers movie would have been even more reliant on its human characters. Screenwriter Roberto Orsi explained to IGN that the very first draft of Transformers was focused almost solely on the lead human characters played by Shia LaBeouf and Megan Fox. This version of the story leans more heavily on the realistic ramifications of a kid buying a car that turns out to be a robotic alien in disguise. That car is sensitive. I mean, $4,000 just drove off. Orsi and company quickly realized that the inaugural draft just wasn't clicking, and subsequent rewrites took the skeleton of Sam Witwicky's storyline from the first pass and injected more material separate from this character. It's understandable. Of course, Transformers fans would want more robots in Transformers movies. While iconic Transformers robots like Optimus Prime and Bumblebee made it to the world of live-action storytelling with Transformers in 2007, other fixtures of the franchise were not so lucky. One example was Arcee. One of the most famous lady robots in the entire Transformers canon, Arcee would have seemed like a slam dunk for inclusion into a big Transformers blockbuster. And you better stay close to me! No, you'd better stay close to me. However, she was nowhere to be found in the franchise's first installment. Screenwriter Roberto Orsi revealed via IGN that RC was originally planned to be a part of Transformers, but female Transformers were a concept that required too much time to sufficiently explain in that original movie. Wanting to avoid any potential complications, Orsi decided to leave RC on the cutting room floor and save her for another day. RC would eventually get to join the live-action incarnation of Transformers through subsequent movies like Transformers Revenge of the Fallen and Transformers Rise of the Beasts. Today, some directors tasked with helming a blockbuster movie adaptation of a beloved nerd property are bound to spend a lot of time talking to the press about how much they love it. Michael Bay, though, has never been one to play by conventional filmmaking rules. The movie cannot have tracks. See the tracks? See the tracks? Yeah. It's no surprise, then, that Bay has always been open about how he was downright contemptuous of the Transformers characters before he signed on to direct Transformers in the mid-2000s. As Collider reported, Bay recalled that he missed the boat on falling in love with Transformers back in the 1980s because he was too young. When he was first offered the chance to direct Transformers and attend a seminar at Hasbro outlining the franchise's lengthy history, Bay remained skeptical of the property. As he recalled, I really thought, what the f*** am I going to Hasbro for Transformers? school. I thought I was going to learn how to fold up robots. However, once he dove deeper into Transformers lore, Bay was entranced with the universe. From there, Bay became a massive Transformers devotee, though he still sought to make the movie appealing to the kind of Transformers non-fans that he used to be. 
Transformers obviously wasn't Michael Bay's first stab at big-budget filmmaking. Thanks to productions like Armageddon and Pearl Harbor, Bay had already become synonymous with expensive spectacle movies. However, Transformers was no mere retread of what he'd done in the past. Most notably, Bay's blockbuster filmmaking efforts before Transformers all centered on flesh and blood people. That changed with Transformers, which hinged its plot on towering robots that were brought into the live-action world by CGI wizardry. Bay worked with animators closely and constantly in post-production to make sure characters were as vividly alive as possible. Having to navigate the finer nuances of animated filmmaking was uncharted territory for Bay at this juncture in his career. But it was that unfamiliarity that excited him when he set out to helm Transformers. Forget the Decepticons, one of the biggest foes the Transformers had to overcome was the Writers Guild of America strike from the end of 2007 to the very start of 2008. This event disrupted the entire film and television industry in North America. Few projects were safe. Not even mega-budgeted tentpoles like Transformers Revenge of the Fallen could be counted on to escape the writers' strike unscathed. In hindsight, director Michael Bay has been quite vocal about how many Revenge of the Fallen shortcomings emerged because of the attempts to make this blockbuster in the middle of the writer's strike. Bay explained to Empire that the pressure of an impending writer's strike ensured that the screenplay for Revenge of the Fallen was put together too hastily, with the primary narrative assembled in just three weeks. Not only did this provide a time crunch for creating a story in the first place, but the lengthy nature of the strike ensured that Revenge of the Fallen missed out on several months where its screenplay could have been polished. I am directly below. The enemy screwed him. Bay didn't lay every flaw in Revenge of the Fallen at the feet of the writer's strike. He also blames the film's incorporation of more fantastical elements as a key reason it came up short. However, it's clear the writer's strike did this movie no favors. It's often hard to tell the various robots apart from one another in the Michael Bay Transformers movies thanks to the character designs, as well as the rapid-fire editing style of the features. But even die-hard fans of this franchise would be hard-pressed to name or remember Jolt, a blue Autobot who transforms into a Chevy Volt. Jolt's screen time in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen is minimal, he has no dialogue, and his only personality trait is having electricity. Jolt! Electrify! Turns out the character's lack of noticeable traits was a byproduct of how late Jolt was added into the script. Screenwriter Roberto Orsi explained to The Hollywood Reporter that Chevy insisted that there be a robot in Revenge of the Fallen that could help promote the Chevy Vault. Considering these circumstances, it's no wonder Jolt was so forgettable. Transformers Age of Extinction didn't address or correct any long-standing problems fans and general audiences alike had expressed with the Transformers franchise, but that didn't seem to hurt the movie's box office prospects. In fact, Age of Extinction became the biggest feature of 2014 at the worldwide box office and the only title from that year to crack $1 billion globally. Further sequels were inevitable, but given how lucrative this franchise was, Paramount Pictures wasn't just settling for doing a straightforward sequel. This studio is now harboring ambitions of Transformers becoming the next Marvel Cinematic Universe, an expansive saga spawning countless spin-offs. In March 2015, news broke that Akiva Goldsman and Michael Bay, among others, were spearheading a writer's room that would figure out multiple different projects set within the Transformers universe. The ambitions were high, and the dense lore attached to the Transformers franchise beyond the live-action movies gave these potential new features plenty of material to utilize. However, the potential of this writer's room has yet to fully come to fruition. While the spin-off movie Bumblebee did premiere in 2018, it took another five years for Rise of the Beast to jump into the fray. The underwhelming box office performance of Transformers The Last Night in 2017 probably forced Paramount to pump the brakes on those big plans for an endless Transformers cinematic universe, at least for a while. What was that? That was a mistake. Michael Bay is no stranger to battle sequences, especially after doing a decade of Transformers movies. But the filmmaker explained to Fandango that the fifth entry in this saga, Transformers The Last Night, contains the most arduous action sequence in his career. Bay openly admitted that he'd never done a period-era medieval battle involving knights before he shot the opening fight sequence of Transformers The Last Night. Most of Bay's big action sequences involved car chases and elements discernibly attached to the modern world. Suddenly, being thrust into the landscape and battle tactics of a period-era setting was an incredibly daunting task for Bay. Bay also had personal problems informing why the sequence was so challenging, as his dog, Bone Crusher, who had appeared in several previous Transformers films, died the night before he shot the sequence. The loss of a pet impacted Bay profoundly, 
and it made the concept of going to shoot a big action sequence the very next day a surreal experience. However, with so many practical tools, including countless horses and extras ready to go for the shoot, Bay had to buckle down and direct a battle sequence like no other in his filmography. The result was a set piece that took three days to shoot, but did leave Bay feeling incredibly accomplished once it was finished. Michael Bay spent an entire decade of his life making Transformers movies. A decade is a long chunk of time, and while Bay didn't exclusively direct Transformers movies over those 10 years, he still dedicated most of his life in that time span to battling robots. Naturally, with the benefit of hindsight, Bay has a lot of complicated thoughts about immersing himself in one fictional world for so long. Bay reflected to Unilad that he did have some regrets about being so ingrained in the Transformers world for so long. He said, I made too many of them. Steven Spielberg said, just stop at three, and I said I'd stop. The studio begged me to do a fourth, and then that made a billion too. And then I said, I'm gonna stop here. And they begged me again. I should have stopped. Five's good, five's good. It is sad, you're right. I mean, it, it is sad, okay? Uh, but five's good. Before he directed Bumblebee, Travis Knight was a director and artist strictly associated with stop-motion animated features. Specifically, he was the man running Leica, the outfit behind groundbreaking films like Coraline and Kubo and the Two Strings, the latter of which Knight also directed. His career up to this point was built on totally original animated properties, which made the idea of him helming a live-action spin-off of the Transformers movies a puzzling proposition. However, Knight explained to Polygon that he'd been a massive Transformers fan ever since he was a kid. This especially informed the prologue set on Cybertron, which was jam-packed with shout-outs to vintage Transformers media, such as a more classical depiction of Soundwave. On paper, Knight may have seemed like a strange choice to helm a Transformers spin-off, but his adoration for those robots in disguise ensured that he was just right to give Bumblebee a spin as its director. 